Go server. That was good. That was Come good. On, this week, man. Man. Do. To the yeah. red man, that's uh, fed man. Fed man. <laughs> <laughs> or stead man. <laughs> Shout out to Sopra. I mean, Oprah. So, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, it's renegade, renegade coach. coach. Renegade oh, coach. Look at him. We matching uh, and stuff uh, like that. Uh, matching up. Matching up. Matchin up. I don't know. You don't know about that? <laughs> What's going on, brother? I'm good, black man. How you feeling? You hey, man, I feel like I'm live and direct at Renegade Coaching Podcast. True. You're going to hit the name right because earlier today we was on that other podcast. Yeah. I'll be messing up, man. It's too much. I'm trying. Whoever give me the check first, I got to shout out my brother. You know how we do around these parts. And who are you, my man? I'm the mighty Kalanji Jama Changa. And I'm black and I'm proud. Not Ooh. like James Brown, but like Mukasa Dada. Okay. Uh, you already gave away the guest. Oh, we do have a guest. Special guest. Although, let's continue with the intro. Please. I'm Kamal K. Franklin, and behind us we got... The Ear Doctor. Okay. And of course, transmitting live by your minister server, along with... Job back in the building. Job yeah. back in the building. Yeah. I was absent last week. Yeah. I know. I see he came back today in this tidy whitey t shirt. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, oh, man. I thought, oh, my man, I'm showing his muscle. Okay, okay. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Yeah. Uh -oh. And he got the young shorts on. Okay. Okay. Young, 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 young shorts. <laughs> we definitely want to see the special. Shirt. Hey, I didn't even know there was a t-shirt that was so tight. I thought, I thought my man Chess was asking. It's all good. Don't we in a place to be? He's like, nah, I'm going to take the titties out tonight. You know what I'm saying? Hey, I was like, all right, you do your thing, man. Word. You do that to yourself, brother. <laughs> anyway. A lot going on, as always. As always, you know what I'm saying? We in the, we in the, in the belly of the beast, yep, yep, a.k.a. Yep. Atlanta, a.k.a. Rap Brown, Georgia. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And the police is still the beast. And, uh... You know, so is the mayor, the governor. That's right. You know what I mean? Speaking of which, what happened earlier? This oh, week? yes. Speaking of which, uh, as we know, we broadcast live from right down the street where my man Ray Sharp Brooks was gunned down about a mile away or not even a mile. Right, you man. know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, we got the unfortunate news. Uh, those of y'all that don't remember Ray Sharp Brooks, we remember this past summer, the brother fell asleep in the Wendy's driveway, drive through mm -hmm. and uh, the Wendy's employee Employees decided that they wanted to call Popo because the man was sleeping in the driveway. Mm -hmm. Police come, long story short, they rap, foot, rap with him for about 29, 30 minutes, uh, interrogating him and harassing him and all that type of stuff, just like pigs do. That's right. right. And uh, they decide they want to take my man to jail. Dude, like, look here, man. Nobody ain't got, ain't nobody got no time for that. Mm -hmm. We ain't trying to go to jail. Mm -hmm. So he wrestling to get him up off him. And while he wrestling him, he tossing him. Uh, one of the pigs pull out a, a taser, yep, yep. and um, he decided, look, I ain't trying to get shocked or electrocuted today. So he snatched the joint and he run for the, run for the gold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pig decides to shoot him in the back twice. In the back. You know I mean? Anyway, this is uh, this pig by the name of Garrett Rolfe. Yeah, yeah. Both of these guys are 27. You know what I'm saying? Garrett Rolfe uh, was a police officer. Your mayor, Keisha. Fired him. Decides to go ahead and fire him. She said, look, you about to take dude out. Yeah. Within 24 hours, she fired him. Now. Just today, or yesterday, yeah. yesterday. the uh, Civil Service Board here in Atlanta decides that they're going to reinstate this man mm -hmm. because of the fact that they felt that there was no due process. Mm -hmm. Not that mm -hmm. my man Ray Sharp Brooks got any due okay. process. That's right. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But this cracker decided that he was going to gun this black man down, and the city said that they didn't see anything wrong with it, so they reinstated his situation. That's right. And something that you pointed out before, you know, Georgia... Is an at will state. You can get fired for anything in Georgia. Any and everything. But apparently, if you shoot a black man in the back, you can get your job back, right? Quickly. So, this due process argument is something that they use to try to, he's getting his back pay. Um, he's gonna be able to, to, to be on the force, even though they won't let him carry a gun, thankfully. But for, this now. All, for now. Yeah. But this all shows how the system is fixed to protect its own, to look out for its own. The police union is behind this. The city of Atlanta, even though it protested, obviously, he's not doing enough. So you know what? It's, it's obvious that this is this, the, the, the normal situation for these cops here in Atlanta, here in the United States. Uh, it's about intimidation, it's about control, and it's about abuse, and it's about oppressing black people. And that's the rule of the day. No doubt. And as always, as we say, in the cities and the place where I come from, mm. fuck the police and their corporate sponsors. True that. Anyway. And along the same line, there's another story more about sort of administration trying to kill its citizens or people that live in the country. Is apparently Alabama, was it? No, South Carolina. South Carolina. What okay, happened? so in South Carolina, they, they're saying that there's a, a shortage of lethal injection drugs. Mm. You know wow. what I mean? So they decided to put on the books that they want, I mean, they just had a little vote. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I forget the numbers. I believe it's like uh, 66, 66 to 43. Yeah. A bill was approved 
saying that they can uh, reinstate the firing squad. Mm. Hmm. Can you imagine that? This, is, could, this is 2021. Yeah, this is old Mexico yeah. back in the day. When this it was, was 2021. Old America. 2021. Wow. Yeah. Old America. They're going to put somebody up against the wall. That's right. Have a row of folks with guns pointed and shoot somebody until they're dead. So they have, you have an this option. This is what though. justice is considered. But wow. they give you an option. They're saying you could either be electrocuted. Uh, the electric chair, they, they been, we been knew that was barbaric. Mm -hmm. You can either be electrocuted or shot up by the firing squad. As I was talking to the brothers a little bit earlier, you know what I'm saying, the firing squad has already been uh, uh, on the books because of the fact the police gun us down in the streets every day. Wow. So they already had the firing squad, but at least now they're going to straight up tell you, look, you have a choice. Do you want to be electrocuted or do you want to stand in front of the firing squad? Mm -hmm. Any brothers and sisters I know, if you got to take it, take, go out hard. Go ahead and let them hit you with that firing squad so we can show America and the rest of the world just how barbaric these racist bastards yeah. are. Wow. America's like one of five nations around the world that still has the death penalty. Right. Mm. All their sort of Western counterparts, uh, at the very least, have banned the death penalty, some of them decades ago. Absolutely. So we still live, like you said, like in this one barbaric, white supremacist state where they think everything is the old West. The right to kill you, the right to, to enslave you, the right to lock you up, all that is always at play in America because they can't get over their white supremacy because white supremacy is how they rule the day. Yo. Also, yeah. to add on to that, we got to remember that uh, America is also 5% of the world population, yet houses 25% of all prisoners in the world. Mm -hmm. That's right, just what I said. 5% of the world population, but a quarter of the world prisoners reside right here in these gulags in the United States. Mm -hmm. wow. They're they going to bring back the stone and the death and the guillotine in a minute. Okay. That'll be next, that'll be next. <laughs> wow. So the last story we got that's happening around the world is at the Tokyo Olympics. Yes. Uh, and the Olympic uh, Commission, International Olympic Commission committee, committee has decided to ban uh, Black Lives Matter apparel, which is a further sort of banning of all political statements, uh, wear, um, uh, uh, actions, and so forth. This is obviously something that the Olympics has always done as they try to depoliticize what's happening around the world. Um, and we know, remember 1968, famous black fist up in the air, and those mm -hmm. folks got their medals taken away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, fuck the Olympics, right? Yeah, so, pretty yeah. much. Uh, fuck, fuck the, fuck Definitely fuck the Olympics. Uh -huh. And I, I want to point out as well that the United States, these racist snake bastards <laughs> that they are, they blaming it on Tokyo. <laughs> now I just want y'all to know. I know some folks in Tokyo, and they don't give a fuck about the English language. <laughs> so most of them don't even read English. So they ain't gonna be like, Black Lives Matter, old as that. Right. You know what I'm saying? They don't wanna be embarrassed in front of the world. Exactly. So they say, okay, blame it on the folks in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. If that shit, if the Olympics would have been held in, in, in Pluto, and, 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 yeah. and, and the air doctor would have been doing the weather from there, mm -hmm. they still would have said that Pluto that's right. Ban Black yeah, Lives man, Matter. Yeah. Right. But yeah. on the flip side, too, fuck Black Lives Matter, too, because we know the real deal on okay. them, too. That's a whole nother story. Right. But anyway, moving so, right along. So we got a great show tonight. Okay. And we got some great contributors, as always, from Patreon. Let's mm -hmm. read off who those folks are that gave us some loot this week. Okay. Yo, so we're going to start off with a big shout out to Hermski. All right. Big okay. up to Daniel Mays. Big up to Tim Ryan. And big up to Trent W. Big up to Shanette. Big up to Geraldo Maza. Big up to Amato A. Big up to Shirley F. Grisby. Big up to Yah for Y. All right. Oh, wait a minute, Dan. Wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, my God. God. Yeah, we got them all. I'm, we got them all. I'm, I'm confused. If we said your name wrong, we didn't. We That's said right. it right. You heard it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best I've ever heard. I know. I'm confused. I'm, 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 going I'm, going I'm like, man, I'm like, coordinated. Y'all fucking up the segment. Y'all fucking up the segment. I understand. Totally. Yeah, Cash from Jersey. Give it up for our brothers from Jersey. All right. All right. And from HBCU. Hold on, Bradley. HBCU. Right. 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 Oh, oh. Um, Sam in the building. Too. Sam in the building. Yeah, well, well, our, our guest that we're going to have on tonight, I remember we was protesting one in one HBCU, HBCU down here in Atlanta because they disrespected him and attacked him uh, some years ago and uh, dislocated his shoulder. Mm. You know what I'm saying? He's, a, he, he's an elder, both his shoulders. So you know what I'm saying? So we're going to talk about that when we come back with our guest of the evening, who our is? main man. His name again? This brother right here, he's the brother who came out with the slogan, Black, Black Power. Power. You right. know what I mean? So many folks have uh, attributed that particular uh, claim to Stokely Carmichael, uh, better known to us as Kwame Torre, mm -hmm. but this was uh, 
one of his main men, and this is the brother who actually came up with the slogan itself, yeah. we're going to have on tonight, Ukasa Dada, formerly right. known as Willie Ricks, who was, uh, I believe, field secretary at SNCC, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway. And you, musical guest. Our yes. musical guest is going to be Red Fidel. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Come Red come Fidel. Turn it, on, turn it out. Right there. Okay. So we come right back on Renegade Culture. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Blow, 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 Black blow. Eye. Happening. Renegade coaches in the building. Yeah, we back on the air. Okay, we got a, got a, a legend with us tonight. Yes, like we always do, right about this time, we had to go uh, reach back and, and reach forward. You know what I'm saying to one of the OGs. So we call our main man, Baba Mukasa Dada. What's happening, Baba? Revolution. Man, revolution. What it's all about, man. Yes, we ain't sir. seen a few minutes. What you been up to? Trying to organize our people. Trying to convince people that the United States. It's the worst uh, uh, monster on the face of the earth that <laughs> need to be destroyed. Okay, all, all right. right. Well, keeping, that, keeping them politics <laughs> alive and well, yeah. No doubt. Gets no better than that. For, for the viewers, because of the fact that, you know, one thing we do here at Renegade Culture, we like to bring in uh, a little bit of everybody. So we had everybody here from uh, Seiko Odinga to... Uh, so you had Jaleel. Jaleel, Jaleel Mutakin. King. Uh, the last poets. Shibuba Ben Wahad. Ruba, we had a little bit of everybody on here. So we felt like it was only right for us to go back and, and holler at our folks from SNCC because we think that SNCC is an underestimated and underrated organization. Mm -hmm. So um, we know that you was the, the field secretary of SNCC. Is that correct? Yeah, I was I a was, uh, organizer. No doubt, no doubt. Can you tell the people, man, what, 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 what is SNCC for the, for, the, for the new cats on the block? Uh, SNCC was the youth movement of uh, the civil rights movement and that uh, in 1961, uh, we got organized and we uh, send young people out to organize in rural areas and on college campuses to create struggle, rebellion, protest, sit-ins. And, uh, and it was just a, a movement. We even got involved in voter registration. So I worked as under John Lewis. I was his general. I was, he was the chairman. I was Stokely Carmichael's general. I was Rap Brown's general. And also uh, Marion Barry's general and Jim Foreman. So I was an organizer and, and I could take people to a level that they can do. Word. Now you always, was SNCC always a little bit more militant, let's say, because it was younger than the general civil rights movement, or did it grow into those uh, politics? How do you feel about that? Well, Ella Baker warned us that when we met in North Carolina and showed the form SNCC, Martin, wanted, Martin King, Dr. Martin King, wanted us to be uh, his youth group. But she told us that these guys are preachers and y'all young people need your own autonomy and you need your own organization. So we formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and we went out to organize and we definitely was more aggressive and more militant uh, and more of organizers than uh, any other organization. That include SCLC, NAACP, Corps, and any other group. Now, now it's, it's, you, you mentioned some people in passing, you know, just, just kind of like, Willy nilly, you you said uh, you mentioned Stokely, you mentioned Marion Barry, you mentioned uh, H. Rap Brown, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? But there were some other folks as well. I know John Lewis was a part of SNCC. John Lewis, Jim Foreman, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, and a host of other people that was equal to them or even stronger and better organizers. Now, Kathleen Cleaver worked with y'all as well. Kathleen right? Cleaver was my secretary. Kathleen Cleaver was your secretary. Yeah. Kathleen Cleaver from the Black Panther uh, Party was a secretary for Mukasa Dada. Yeah, uh, she, matter of fact, she met Erdos Cleaver at a black, the first group when we said black power and walked through Mississippi for 250 miles fighting and being bombed and, and what have you. Uh, the first, and we called for black power, and the first students, the first group, to say we endorse black power and have a black power conference was a student at Fish University in Tennessee State. And we went there for that conference and Kathleen, all of us went there. Eldridge Cleaver was the first place he came to after he got out of jail, he came there. And uh, when he got there, uh, we had the conference, but in the middle of the conference, police shot a young man in the back of the head hmm. and the bullet came out of his nose. So we turned the conference out and the kids that endorsed black power 
we went out in the streets with the people that was rebelling and they were throwing bricks and balls and firebombs and the kids in the conference who would call for black power, they uh, were SNCC youth group, uh, college group, and they were out there first, they were telling the people, no, don't throw bricks, this is not how we do it, be, be nonviolent. And I went out there and I fired all of them. <laughs> and, and then uh, all the people that were throwing fire bombs and bricks, I said, now you a snick. And we continue to throw bricks and balls. But the first rebellion, a uh, black power rebellion uh, to go up, or the first student rebellion to go up was at Fish University in Tennessee State. Mm. Now we remember June 16th, 1966 is given as the date that the, the slogan sort of came alive in terms of like you guys was on the march in Mississippi after James Meredith was shot. Um, and you know, the, the, the famous story being told of course is that uh, I, uh, at the time Stokely Carmichael was walking with Dr. King, you were sent to sort of pump up the crowd and see whether or not the crowd was ready to give the call and response to black power. You came back and reported to Stokely like they're ready, they're ready. And Stokely said like, oh, you're a little too fired up. I mean, that's, that's not overestimate where the crowd is. And as it turned out, when the chant was given, everybody was so primed to, to, to shout back and be like, you know, no more civil rights, we want black power. So what, what do you think was happening during that time period that made people sort of this, this ready, so ready for that, that kind of switch from this sort of traditional civil rights approach, nonviolent approach to shouting, we want power? Because we had went through Mississippi. At that time, we had to go in the back door, say yes to all white people, and we were being assassinated. Uh, like Melga Evans, uh, three civil rights workers, mm -hmm. Sammy Young Jr. in Tuskegee, Alabama, who worked with SNCC, went into a bathroom to say white on the white man shot him in the head with a shotgun. The murder of uh, 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 many other SNCC people burned down churches, mm -hmm. uh, uh, burned down schools, and they used terrorism against the people, and they had been doing that for the last 100, 200 years. So people were in slavery, basically, but uh, we built, we uh, fought for the right to vote. They beat Fannie Lou Hamer, and but we built the SNCC, whatever it would go, it would start organizations and, that, and then create leadership. And then we would be the advisors. And that was the difference in Dr. King and SNCC. We were organized and we create local leadership where the preachers come in, they saw themselves as the leader. Mm -hmm. So we had a different style of organizing. And that, uh, so when we, organized Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and many of the local group. We had organized the Black Panther Party in Lyons County, Alabama, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where we picked up guns. So people going through all this kind of terrorism, uh, they had recently beat John Lewis and all the people are the chairman stick at that time, beat them on the bridge, ran horses over. They had killed a couple of people in Lyons County, Alabama, where we were organizing. When the people tried to register to vote, they put them out off the reservation and put them, tried to run them out the county, mm -hmm. but we got tents and built tent cities. They would come down there and shoot in the tents, and we got guns, and when they would come to shoot in the tents, we started shooting back, so we began to be more militant. Mm -hmm. But then we chose the Black Panther for our symbol. That's where we started the Black Panther Party in Lowndes County, Alabama, and we chose the Black Panther for our symbol for our party, mm -hmm. the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, uh, the white people and the other people start saying, this is just a terrorist group. They, they're militant. They got a Black Panther and what have you. Why would you choose a Black Panther? Uh, a Black Panther. We said, fool, because Black Panther's black. And we said, we're proud, <laughs> of the black, we're proud of the Black Panthers. And we picked up guns. And when they would come to shoot at us, we would shoot back. We had gun battles where even white people got killed. And that uh, they shot down John and Daniel. That's the kind of way they killed Viola Luzo, mm -hmm. and uh, they killed some other people in Selma. So we were facing a state of war. And that, uh, so when we went into Mississippi and they passed the Voters Rights Bill, uh, we had gone through so much terrorism that James Merritt, who had went to integrate the University of Mississippi, he had came out with a sign saying, march against fear. Mm -hmm. And telling the people don't have no fear and when he, went out, they shot him in the back. Mm -hmm. And when he shot him in the back, Dr. King, Floyd McKissick, uh, Stokely, and Deacons for Defense, who we helped organize in Bogalus, Louisiana, met in Memphis, Tennessee at the Lorraine Motel, the same hotel Martin died in. Mm -hmm. um, 
to carry the march on. We started carrying the march on. It was a lot of violence that we met uh, and and uh, what have you, but we called for black power. We started saying, we need black power, we need power. And I was explaining to the people that we had power, we wouldn't be sharecropping, working all year and then don't get paid to tell us we owe them money. We would have decent schools, we wouldn't be, we'd have a real bathroom, wouldn't have all these outhouses. We would have, wouldn't live in all these shacks. They wouldn't be beating us, killing us like they're doing and that we need black power. Mm -hmm. And that when we started talking about black power, we went through Mississippi, and as we talked about black power, we got more militant. And matter of fact, uh, I remember once the sheriff say, uh, we want to use the courthouse to have our rallies on, and the sheriff said, y'all can't use the courthouse. I said, well, we can't use it, we'll burn it down. <laughs> he said, uh, 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 nigga, our, our, our courthouse is fireproof. I said, then we'll blow that motherfucker up. <laughs> and so we had changed the attitude. We got more militant, more militant. Brothers began to come around Black Power, and the march began to get much, very militant. Mm -hmm. And then on the march, uh, Stokely uh, told me, said, get these white folks off, tell them to go home. Go organize in the white community. So we ran the white people off the march, so we had Martin King there, and SNCC was, uh, Mississippi was the area that SNCC had organized in. And when Dr. King came there, he was coming in the SNCC territory. Mm -hmm. And matter of fact, Stoker told him the first day that when we march to Mississippi, this is SNCC territory, and we won't be nonviolent. Mm -hmm. And so Roy Wilkins, the head of the NAACP, and Whitney Young, they pulled out and mm -hmm. said they didn't want to do it. But the first day, Stoker got in fight with a state trooper, and Dr. King broke it up and mm -hmm. whatever. And then as we went down through Mississippi, we were black power and dominating Dr. King. And we took Dr. King uh, through them cotton fields and all down through there, mm -hmm. uh, gave him some experience and some work that he'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. And that uh, he began to have a lot of respect for me, but a lot of fear of me because he felt that I was always organized and got young people ready to throw bricks and balls and, and what have you. And so he always tried to keep me near him, like when they get ready to have lunch, uh, bring Rick's with you, bring with Rick's with you. Don't let him so be out there I end up, up getting a lot of meals, even with Dr. King, <laughs> when the community would cook. Yeah. But when we went through Mississippi, we were, had to fight on many occasions. And when Dr. King tried to go out and organize, he had a march in Philadelphia, Mississippi, the town where they had killed Chaney, Swan, and Goodman. Mm -hmm. And Sheriff Rainey and those uh, ran a, a truck right through the march, and that night they came down in the black community and they tried to start shooting, but our people started shooting back. Mm -hmm. Ralph Featherstone, I don't know if you heard the name, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's the brother that was blown up in Bel Air, Maryland, mm -hmm. and that uh, him and uh, he was organizing at that time, and they shot back and a deputy sheriff got killed, and that night uh, in, in Yazoo City, Dr. King had asked me because the young people were militant and they were leaning toward me. I was the main speaker yeah. because I had to be the spokesman for John Lewis, for Stokely, for Rap, for Foreman, all of them. They were college brothers and sisters but and that they could talk and they were very intellectual and, and what have you, but they couldn't get on a truck and rouse people yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. So anytime the SNCC needed somebody to rouse people up, I was called to all these areas to go to these different towns. So that put me on the stage with Dr. King and all the speakers because mm -hmm. I could get up there and, and rouse people up just like Martin could or even better. Sounds like you still can, brother. I mean, that was, that's, so we're going to take our first break. I want to stop you there. The original riot started. All right, so exactly, exactly. <laughs> when we come back, we're going to get deeper into SNCC because I think, you know, they have an incredible organizing yeah. history and all the names and stuff that you've mentioned. We want to get into the, the, the whole uh, Yeah, we're going to get into yeah. the split that happened with Stokely and, and, um, and, and, uh, and, and, um, Black John Black. Lewis, yeah, yeah. and then we want to talk later on about the sort of the combining briefly of the Panthers and SNCC, because uh, I don't think people would know that history enough too. So we're gonna come back on, on Renegade Culture. Renegade yeah. Culture, yeah. Black, Black Power. Power. Black yeah. Power. Good. What up? Renegade culture. We're in the building, Black Power Media. Yo, true, you know what I'm true. Understand that because of the fact, for those of you that don't know, the media company we rock with is BPM Black Power Media, mm -hmm. and we honored to have Mr. Black Power up on Black Power Media okay, today. You, man. you know what I'm saying? Mukasa Dada. Um, definitely, man, I appreciate you because of the fact that 
when I first got to Atlanta, you was one of the first people that showed me love when we got here. The first mm -hmm. joint we did was Poets for Political Prisoners, and the first lecture I actually did mm -hmm. was with Baba Mukasa over at uh, Auburn Avenue Research Library. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And out the gate, it, it, was, it was always, whenever I called them, whether we doing rallies, whether we doing uh, lectures, events, eating some food, you know what I'm saying? As <laughs> long, as, it, long as there's some Africans in the house, he gonna he be there. there. <laughs> and if there was some African sisters there, Mother Africa gonna be treated right first. <laughs> so anyway, glad to see you, man. So, Thank you, um, yeah, so you, we was talking about uh, SNCC and we was talking about Lowndes County. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, I gotta commend you because, and, and say that like a lot, a lot of times in, the, in this new era, folks be talking about, uh, we're not our grandparents. Maybe your grandparents were suckers. But I know <laughs> folks like y'all, I mean, y'all was actually organizing in places that to this day give me goosebumps. Okay. When you talk about Mississippi and Lowndes County, Alabama, when you talk about organizing Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi, mm. you can organize any damn way on the planet. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Especially in the middle of that heat. Y'all was out there when them crackers was really turned up. Mm. They turned up now, but they wasn't nothing to play with back then. And y'all was out there, so definitely salute for that because of the fact that organizers today really don't know what organizing is. Well, that's you the ain't truth. do that yeah. right there. Yeah, people yeah. don't know how to hit the ground, how like, you know, you guys have such an incredible history of like hitting the ground, living with people, organizing people, taking people where they're at and moving them politically. So let's talk a little bit about who you are, your background, um, because, you know, it's important sort of to establish you were raised in Alabama. Tell us a little bit about your family history. Well, my family was raised in North Alabama in an area called Rixus. All the white folk named Ricks, all the black folk named Ricks. And we know that we were bought, off, bought from Jamestown, Virginia, and carried to North Alabama to pick cotton and work in that area. And, and uh, when I was a young man, I used to go to Alabama and chop cotton and make $3 a day, work from 6 in the morning, 6 at night. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to say from can't to can't, can't see it in the morning until you can see it at night. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did that, and, but I, that was my experience in that. And then my mama said she worked for a quarter day. And then my great granddaddy lived in Georgia, but him and his twin brother did, was fighting white people, and that they had to jump in the river and swim across the river. That's how they got away from the white people. Mm. And they made it to North Alabama wow. and changed their name, went on a native Indian reservation and, uh, and survived and created a family. And then uh, my mama had an alien name. She never told us to uh, later along in life, she told we get found out about it. Mm -hmm. And then she um, housed the civil rights people from Stokely to Rap to Clee Sellers to Black Panthers and all of them could come to the house, need a place to stay, eat. She f mm. uh, used that house to do that and encouraged me to go and get involved in the city and movement and civil rights movement. And many threats were made on her life, on mm. my family's life, by the crosses and that kind of thing. And that's, is that what got you sort of politicized? Was that those experiences? Uh, I didn't, I don't know exactly, but I uh, was a young man and did what young people do. Yeah. And then um, I had quit school in the seventh grade. I went to the pool halls and went to the streets and what have you. And then by 1960, after my experience, go hanging out in schools and stuff, uh, doing whatever I, I wanted to do, uh, the city movement kicked off. And then my sister got involved in it immediately. And I immediately got involved, got involved in it and encouraged people to come march with us and demonstrate. And we went downtown in Chattanooga, Tennessee had a city in and we were beat up or had to fight our way out of there and, and we fought and threw bricks and balls and whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the next day we brought a thousand people down and or more and turned the whole school out in half the city and went down and had a big riot, big rebellion. And that once we had that rebellion, it got national attention because it was the first rebellion in the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. nonviolent movement, but we fought and didn't know nothing about nonviolent. And that's when <laughs> and that's when C T <clears throat> Vivian yeah. and S E L C people and the NAA people they came, taught us about nonviolence and had us to let them <laughs> hit us in the face, spit on us and say, This is what you have to take off these white people and uh, I didn't believe didn't know nothing about it. 
and that uh, I asked the nonviolent guy to let me hit him, and I hit him in the jaw. And <laughs> from that day on, I wouldn't carry nonviolence to Birmingham and throughout mm -hmm. the South. Mm -hmm. And the nonviolent people had a lot of courage, yeah. and they yeah. were some brave people because they faced dogs, bombs, and everything else, and they would turn out what, what we were doing, it would turn in the whole city out and, and bring, bring disruption to the whole city, mass jail and beaten, even face death. They put bombs in our churches like they did in Birmingham. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we were facing death to do that and try to register people to vote and all those kinds of things. But uh, I got involved in that. And once we had a rebellion in Chattanooga, uh, C.T. Vivian and you know, say, well, a youth organizations being formed, and when the youth organization being formed, Dr. Keenum said that they didn't want me in their organization, but they called uh, uh, Jim Foreman and Ruby Dodge Robinson and Ella Baker and said, we got this extreme militant brother up here. <laughs> and that, uh, and SNCC was being formed, they said, come on. And that's when I went there. I went there on the recommendation of King and mm. C.T. Vivian and whatever. So that put me on a different little stage. Yeah, Everybody yeah. had respect for me from the recommendation that I had got from there. But I was just in the movement and, and uh, just a young man mm -hmm. that uh, when time came, I found myself in the movement. So when we started sitting in in the movement, we sit in, we had rebellion. And once we had rebellion, um, hundreds of people came out and then it broke down to a few people. And before you know it, we had 20, 30 people that would just demonstrate every day, and I was the one that kept it going. Mm -hmm. And then I was uh, put in jail over and over again, and then uh, they burnt cross in my yard. Do you even remember how many times you were locked up? Oh, 20, 30 times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember time, but all over the place. Mm -hmm. I used mm -hmm. to go to jail, get out, go back, mm -hmm. and whatever. And they burnt crosses in my yard. Uh, they used to call my mom and threaten her. Mm. Matter of fact, Al Gore's daddy, Albert Gore, mm. was a senator. Yeah. He used to call my house and tell my mom what they were going to do if they didn't stop me from being in the movement and whatever. They put my picture all up in the mountains of uh, Tennessee, mm -hmm. uh, and they saw me as this extreme militant person mm -hmm. in this area. And so uh, I just stayed involved and continued yeah. to be involved, and SNCC called, and... I found myself uh, in Albany, Georgia, and mm -hmm. Lee County, Georgia. In Lee County, Georgia, uh, uh, we tried to register people to vote. They, uh, when we tried to register people to vote, they uh, machine gunned Mr. James' mm -hmm. house. Mm -hmm. They uh, burnt down the church, we used to, three churches that we used to meet in, one on the Lee County Highway on 95 and right outside of uh, Leslie and Leesboro, mm -hmm. one in Sasser, Georgia. And uh, we were to organize in Dawson or try to take people to register to vote. They would throw dynamite on our porch. Mm. And then sometimes they would come by and machine gun the house. And uh, one of the SNCC people got shot. So we faced all that. But not only that in, in Georgia here, but we were also facing the same thing in Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, terrorists were also facing the same thing in Mississippi where they were machine gunners. So, uh, burning down our churches, burning down our meeting places, putting us in jail. And we, at any given time, SNCC had 200 people demonstrating across the South uh, yeah. at the same time. I want to I quickly, I'm sorry, I want to quickly talk, to, ask you though about, because, um, you know, last year, John Lewis passed away. Mm -hmm. And and, CT Vivian. And, CT, and and in particular, at John Lewis's funeral, Bill Clinton got up and talked about how um, you know, we were ready for uh, that. You know, John Lewis was was the man, and at one point there seemed to be too much too much Stokely, but he glad that John Lewis, you know, became the man or whatever like that. So this is an important phase in in SNCC's public history again was the vote for against uh, or the vote in terms of who would be the leader of SNCC mm -hmm. between John Lewis and Stokely Carmichael. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what that time was like for SNCC in terms of choosing a more overt militant leader? Um, as opposed to John Lewis, who sort of was more seen as like a, a young uh, Dr. King, as opposed to Stokely, who was kind of seen as a young Malcolm X, right? Yeah, when we first started out to be nonviolent and, and, and to have love for our enemies and, and, and those kinds of things, pray for them and what have you, that was a norm and a very militant thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But as time went on, John Lewis at some point uh, had the most militant organization and chaired uh, the most militant organization. Now, before John Lewis, you had Marion Barry and, the, uh, and a, another, a couple other chairmen. And then John Lewis came in 1963. And one of the things in SNCC, our chairmen lasted for one year and then we were changed. Mm -hmm. But John Lewis happened to slip by for two years. Mm -hmm. And that uh, he was good at that time. And that, uh, but as we went on, John began to hold on to the nonviolence and, and very peaceful kind of guy. And that uh, by after we had uh, went into Lowndes County, Alabama, picked up guns and fought, we had Snick use nonviolence as a tactic, where Martin saw it as a principle. Mm -hmm. So we could change. So when we go out there and take it nonviolent, let a crack of slappers or hit us, and we would take it. If he hit too hard or too many times, we kick his ass. <laughs> or if he follows us around the corner, we fuck him up. <laughs> and there's no part about it. And at the same time, a lot of sneak people carried guns. Mm -hmm. So when they came and uh, started shooting at us, we would shoot back, uh, be ready to shoot back. And some people would not give up their guns. And then after John was chairman for two years, we had put together the Black Panther Party. We had the Deacons for Defense in uh, Bogalusa, Louisiana, uh, and other uh, milit very militant movement, we was in confrontation all the time. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, we, it, after that point, we came to a point that John, uh, you no longer represent our views because we are more militant than that. We are for more of a, a, a stronger stand and we don't need uh, somebody that's imitating Dr. King. And that we told John, we voted John out. Matter of fact, I chaired the meeting. And we voted John out. When John was getting ready to get voted out, everybody got up and started criticizing and calling him weak and whatever. Mm. And John turned to me and he said, Rick, Rick, help me, help me do something. I said, he, John used to like to say, if you, pull, if you see me in a fight with a bear, I pull honey on me. I said, brother, I don't have nothing but honey for you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> So John, so John was voted out, yeah. and Stokely uh, at that time was voted in, and they tried to say that uh, he was coup d'etat and all that. Mm -hmm. But his time had just ran out, and that uh, we had changed, a, uh, come to another stage, and we immediately, shortly after that was in May, uh, May 15, something like that, and then by June 5th, we were on the Black Power March, and taking the movement to a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. And when Stoker was voted in, we had already hit him with the Black Power, Black Panthers, and then we hit with Black Power. When we hit with Black Power, we started talking about Black Power, and then uh, we faced a lot of violence on that march, but it shocked the whole world because they bombed us at, when Dr. King was, uh, he, they pushed Dr. Gaston Miller, mm -hmm. Dr. King tried to back out of Black Power and try to distance himself for it. When he was in Yazoo City, uh, I was supposed to introduce him that night. He was going to introduce me, but then he backed off of it and caused of, uh, uh, of some violence that had happened in Philadelphia when we shot back. And I said, that's black power. When the white folks came in our neighborhood and tried to shoot it up and we shot back, that's black power. And Dr. King got up to the meeting after me, after I spoke, and I would always speak on the program with Martin he got up and said, we don't need no black, white power. We don't need no red power. We don't need no uh, uh, different black yeah, color yeah. power. Then he got the black power. We had our people right in his face, black power, <laughs> black power. <laughs> and then he even said, ain't nobody going to make me act like George Wallace. Ain't nobody going to make me act like the Ku Klux Klan. Ain't nobody going to make me act like Hitler. We don't need black power. We just need black power, black power. <laughs> and then, Martin, we, we were, it was clear that it was two different forces. Mm -hmm. And then he had uh, a traitor like Andrew Young mm. right there with him, pulling him to the right mm -hmm. and saying, you got to be against black power. And and had clearly showed that he worked for the police department no in Montgomery when uh, we had a march from Alabama State. Uh, they ran. They ran horses over us, just like they did John and Selma. Mm -hmm. And when they ran the horses over us, and they hurt children and people, 
and I was on top of a car making a speech, calling the president of the United States a liar, murderer, or whatever, mm -hmm. and that uh, and the people were around it just running back from being beaten and stuff, and I was on top of the car talking to him, and uh, come around and looked up here, Andrew Young come around the corner with over 50 police hmm. saying, Willie Ricks, break this up, this is against the law. <laughs> And they rushed the march, and people had to scatter again. But Andy showed himself clearly to work with the government, work with the police, work with the FBI department, and whatever. And that's who he's always been. That's why he became mayor. That's mm -hmm. why he awarded mm -hmm. him as ambassador. That's yes. why he, any time the white people are in trouble, mm -hmm. they call Andrew Young. Mm -hmm. So that's Martin right. has them kind of people around him, mm -hmm. and they weaken him. But when let me stop. Wait a minute. Let me stop you there, because we we got to take a break, and when we come back. We want to finish this story, okay. and then talk a little bit more about the history of SNCC and the Black Panthers, and on, uh, and yeah. also get into some of the international pieces, because you got no interesting problem. pieces going. in regards to uh, Idi Amin and a number of other. Oh, oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. So we hear all that. No doubt. Renegade we'll culture. culture. Renegades. With the renegade as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Black power. Tab, the Renegade Coach is in the building. That's yeah. right, we back on the air, man. And, and what, 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 what station we rock with? Black Power Media. Black Power Media. Who we got with us tonight? We got Brother Mukasa Dada. Yeah, we're gonna talk about yeah, Black, Black Power. 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 We're gonna talk about Black Power. We That's bring right. Black Power on, to man. the Black Power. Mm -hmm. Anyway, man, I, I'm, I'm like trying to figure out where to jump in right now because <laughs> of the fact that we got so much to talk about in so little time. We might have to extend this joint a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? The air doctor might be mad, but we might just have to do that. <laughs> um, first and foremost, we, 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 we talked about SNCC, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you talked about you getting involved, so on and so forth. Um, moving forward, mm -hmm. what was SNCC's role? Because of the fact that we know that a lot of different members from SNCC ended up in, in uh, organizing with the Black Panther Party of, uh, of California, of Oakland. Mm. Can you speak to that? Like, how, how did that go about? And, and, and there was a merger at one point. Okay, I'll go to this. Let me just go to two things. Okay. First, uh, when we were on the Black Power March, mm -hmm. we got to Canton, Mississippi, and that uh, there was a little confriction here. And Dr. King, we were all on top of a truck getting ready to make a speech and the masses of the people had gathered around in the schoolyard. And we were getting ready to make the speech. Dr. King was on top of the truck. Stokely, uh, Floyd McKissick, uh, Hosea, and myself was on top of the truck. And we were getting ready to make our speech. And we looked up. State troopers had surrounded the whole park in gear. And Dr. King say, uh, immediately called the meeting and said on the truck, look, we, we may get hurt, we may get killed, whatever happened, but we don't need everybody to go to jail. He said, Jose, you and Willie Ricks, uh, we are signing y'all to get off this truck and fall back, and don't y'all go to jail, get hurt, and if we get hurt, y'all have to take our place. So they appointed me and Jose to take the leadership if Dr. King, Stokely, or Floyd McKissick got hurt or went to jail or got killed. Mm -hmm. And that that was a high position to even when I think about it. And then they shot the gas and, and uh, hit the truck real hard. And Dr. King ended up falling off the truck. Stokely fell off. And you can see a picture of me going and they shot gas. Everybody was hurt out there. A lot of gas. And, and I ran back in there into the march and picked up Stokely and Dr. King. It's a picture of me carrying both of them. And Stokely told me, say, Lighting up on Martin, he really trying, he trying to hang with us. And that, uh, at that point we did. And then, uh, but Dr. King was trying and that, at that, right after the end, everybody was saying, what is this black power? Cause black power shook up the world. Mm -hmm. And then everybody was saying, what is this black power? And the people in Detroit defined the black power when they went out and, and uh, started burning down the cities and, and they were black power. And 30, 40, 50 people laying in the streets dead. 20,000 people they browned up, put in prison, whatever. And all the cities began to burn down. And uh, black power and dead bodies laying everywhere. They brought truth back from uh, 82nd. 
back in Atlanta in, in Detroit and other cities to fight and shoot and kill us. They had orders to shoot to kill. But the cry was black power, black power. We need black power. And we said black power. Black power brought on a whole nother attitude and a consciousness. And people began to say, black is beautiful. Uh, we need power. We need black power. And that, uh, at that time, when we talked about black power, we were talking about power for black people. And at that time, also, when they killed my friend, Sammy Young Jr., who worked with SNCC, went into a bathroom in Tuskegee, Alabama, and caused a sign on and said, white only at a Greyhound bus station, uh, at a gas station, too. Uh, the crack, uh, the army, uh, uh, how you say, Sigmund, shot him in the head with a shotgun on January the 3rd. And then Snick immediately had a meeting saying, we'll, uh, if you can, can go into the army, be in the Navy, come back to the United States, can't piss where a white man pissed, we oppose the war in Vietnam. And then we called on people to protest the war in Vietnam. And uh, we put thousands of people in the streets against the war in Vietnam. Julian Bond was at that meeting. He was had been elected state, Senate, state representative. And they asked him, you agree with that? He said, yes and they expelled him from the state senate, mm. and that created another movement. But now you have black power, you have cities burning down, and all the civil rights people spoke out against it, and Martin spoke out against it at first, and the police department started praising him. And I went to Martin and said, look, Martin, they praising you. You can't speak out against black people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then Martin came and wrote his book, and he began to condemn the United States and talk about the United States was the perpetrator of violence and whatever. We came out against the Vietnam War March 6, uh, January the 6th, and Dr. King ended up coming out against it uh, 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 the 4th uh, of April, 1967, April 4th. And what they would do, we forced him to do it. He had no choice but to speak out because you had thousands and millions of people out saying, hell no, we won't go and stop the war. And when Dr. King was forced to speak out against the war on April 7, he took a position, a strong position. The United States government, FBI, had a policy that what they do around the world, if you do something great and good, they kill you or destroy you on that anniversary. So on the anniversary of Dr. King speaking out against the war in Vietnam, April 4th, they shot him on April 4th. One and year later. Yeah. One year later, and about two months before they killed him, I was on uh, uh, February the 7th, I was in Dr. King's house because he had told me that anytime you want some clothes, I come to your house and you ain't got me the clothes. Say, so, yeah, I have plenty of people, give them to me. So if you want some clothes, come to my house, you can get it. I went over there one night to get the clothes, some clothes. Martin, I need some clothes, I got something to do tonight. <laughs> and I was over there getting some clothes, and I was in his bedroom, and I turned to Martin and said, Martin, they out to get you. Stokely said it to me. I said to Martin, Martin, they out to get you. FBI, police, whoever, they out to get you. He said, who is they? I said, I don't know, but they out to get you. And that, you don't uh, I think told he believed? That, he, didn't, he didn't believe? He didn't know. He, the, said, he just said, who is they? Because mm -hmm. Dr. King had become very paranoid of the Black Power Movement and the Black Nationalist Movement also yeah, 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 yeah. because the Black Power Movement was interrupting whatever he marched, done violent. It just took one brick uh, 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 one uh, over at a police and they would beat everybody in the crowd, including King. Let me stop you because I want to get back to Kalanji's question because we have a limited amount of time. I want, okay. I want to talk about a little bit the Panthers and the stick merger. Because well, what SNCC would do yeah. is, again, they would organize local groups, and everywhere SNCC would go, they would organize an organization, and that organization would go to Albany, organize Albany, get executive staff, this is your organization, we advise you. And go to Mississippi, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, Fannie Lou Hamann, all the people that we organize, y'all in charge of, y'all executive, we the advisors. In Birmingham, they everywhere SNCC go, they create local organizations. Went to Lowndes County, Alabama, create the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. We were not in it, but we advised it and worked with it. And then when uh, here, when we did that in Lowndes County, here at Newton, them called us and the other groups called from different areas, said, we want to be Black Panther. We like y'all. Y'all influence us with guns. You're looking good. Mm -hmm. And we told them, come, you can be Black Panther. We let them come in our office, let them use our machinery, help put them out there. 
Uh, at that time, the only people that would speak up for the cities that were burning down was Stokely, Rap, and SNCC people, Jim Forum and SNCC people. Mm -hmm. And that we let them put uh, our name on their organization. And when they went in there with guns and had Stokely, Carmichael, Rap Brown, and former's name on their organization, then that gave them international attention and the cities burned this what they uh, we were spoken for and they considered us as burned down city. Matter of fact, Martin always thought that whatever city burnt down that I had been in the city. <laughs> he died thinking that I started all the rebellions. Uh, so then once all the rebellion and the Black Panthers, we brought them in, let them do it, and we gave it to them, so this is your organization. And we used our name, and remember Stoke the Rap and all them, they were SNCC, mm -hmm. but uh, we used, put our name on the organization, and they were honorary chairman, honorary minister of Def uh, defense, I think, and, and uh, whatever, for international, whatever, we were just honorary. Mm -hmm. But our organization, the base organization was SNCC, and at a point, we associated with them, and after a while, we broke away from and said, you got it on your own because one of the things that they wanted to do is bring white people back in the organization. And we had expelled them out of our community. And they united with the Peace and Freedom Party and the Freedom and Peace Party because they wanted to build a movement to get Hugh Newton out of jail. Mm -hmm. And we said that wasn't the most important thing. And we wanted we were pushing more toward black nationalism and nationalism. Mm -hmm. And then when the city started burning down black power, now we come to link up. We spoke out for the Palestinians uh, against Zionism, and we spoke out against them attacking Egypt. And then we linked up with Ho Chi Minh, took people to Viet to Vietnam, mm -hmm. and said we negotiated with uh, Ho Chi Minh and told Ho Chi Minh we want to come and fight on the street. Ho Chi Minh said, "No, this is not your fight. Mm -hmm. Your fight is Africa." Mm -hmm. And he pointed us toward Africa. And come to know, Ho Chi Minh was also a follower of Marcus Garvey mm -hmm. and inspired mm -hmm. by Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. And then when Ho Chi Minh pointed us toward Africa, Stokely now go to uh, um, Africa and join in with Kwame Nkrumah and Sekou Toure. But at the same time, in 1965, John Lewis, Nick, John Lewis, uh, Jim Foreman, mm -hmm. myself, and others went to the South African embassy in 1965, kicked their door down in, at the United at the embassy, and went in there and kicked their ass. We whooped their ass, <laughs> all of them, all of them. So we whooped their sneaker. ass. We whooped their ass and said we demand the freedom of our people in South Africa. Mm -hmm. That include Mandela, Robert Sabugwe, and other. Uh, freedom fighters in South Africa. Yeah, and yeah. when we did that, now we linked in to led us right into the movement with Angola, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and uh, Guinea-Bissau, and other liberation movements. Mm -hmm. We joined, now we join in and start speaking up for them, becoming their spokesman, sending them materials, and whatever, and even some going there and helping fighting. And we also join in with Nicaragua, the Sandinistas, mm -hmm. and El Salvador, Guatemala, uh, join in with uh, other movements around the world yeah. that was fighting against the United States. And SNCC and the Black Power Movement helped Vietnam defeat the United States. Mm -hmm. We said, well, you, burn, you whoop them in Vietnam, we'll whoop burn them. the cities down <laughs> right here. So sometimes people, yeah. they had to bring their truth back to face us yeah, yes. in the streets, and we were their spokesmen. So people don't realize the history, the anti-imperialist history that that yes, the man. movements of the '60s had that yeah. made them so powerful and such a threat. Because as opposed to integrating within the United States system, the 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 organizers and radicals and revolutionaries of that time became the folks who were saying, we were in the belly of the beast, we will fight the beast here, and you will fight there, but we are united in struggle, which is something activists and organizers just don't get today. Like yeah, absolutely, yeah. and we joined in with Castro, Fidel Castro. We started going into Cuba, uh, getting advice and training. Some people getting trained in terms of explosives. Don't, don't talk about too much now, don't talk about too much. And, and, and so all kinds of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Some people were getting yeah. trained and going there. We joined in with El Salvador and those other people mm -hmm. and other movements around the world. And we were anti-imperialism. Yeah. And we began to talk about uh, Pan-Africanism. And Marcus Garvey now become a main force. Patrice Lumumba and Malcolm, he explained the way he gave us, uh, uh, when they killed him, Malcolm was weak. 
and not known before they killed him. Hmm. And then when they killed him, we passed out tapes and put them underground, have them, everybody listen to tapes on Malcolm, till Malcolm became the most known brother and the spokesman and the guide for the movement. And then we began to look at other liberation movements around the world. Mm -hmm. Patrice Lumumba in the Congo became a major hero. We saw the crimes of the United States government there. And then we just began to expose the government and began to see and make our movement. So we helped liberate Angola, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and other uh, nations in the world. Uh, we, uh, matter of fact, Mao Zedong, we used to use the Red Book, teach uh, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. street brothers how to read and mm -hmm. bring them in. And they learned how to read the little Red Book and the principles of the Red Book and whatever, looking up to Mao Zedong and whatever and whatever. And, you know, we began to talk about uh, Africa and talk to tell people they were Africans. And that was a major one. Telling people they were black was a battle. And then uh, telling people they were Africans and I started pushing Africa so hard that everybody named me Africa. Everywhere I would go, it's still now. Hey, African, hey, African, and whatever. But I was telling people they were African, and Africa was a shock mm -hmm. to a lot of people. And we did that, and then we would tell them about the great Africa and mm -hmm. talk about, you know, the richest land in the world, diamonds, yeah, gold, yeah. oil, rubber, zinc, and whatever. And then talk about Ghana, Mali, Sunghe, yeah. Zimbabwe, and just all that kind of education we gave now, people. We, now, we got to wrap up soon, but you have, there's one, interesting story about how you got your name I think y'all were alluding to earlier yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. so we want you to tell folks about how you got the name Mukasa well I was a guest of a uh, 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 I was in the All African People's Revolutionary Party mm -hmm. and we were invited by Idi Amin to come to Uganda and we went to Guinea with Sacred Toure and uh, went with Mary McKeever and Sacred Toure and we also was in Liberia and uh, Sacred Toure said, Mukasa, I hear that you have a thing about the movement in the Congo. I want you to go out there and hang out with some of his people. So they made contact with Lumumba's family and friends. Mm. And I went out and hung out with some of Lumumba's uh, folks. And I stayed in the Guinea Embassy. Uh, and then uh, I went on a, 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 a diplomatic mission for Secretary of Guinea, President Secretary of Guinea, put me on a diplomatic thing to Guinea to go to Uganda and invite it, the president, Idi Amin, to come to you to Guinea. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, so where I was there, I got a chance to uh, uh, hang out with Idi Amin. Uh, when he uh, uh, came back to the country, he allowed me to walk next to him and inspect the troops. All the troops had to do that mm -hmm. to me and whatever. And then at night, he would bring, uh, he picked me up in, uh, on, in helicopters Army helicopter, army planes, and take us different places and whatever. And that, uh, so anyway, I was able to do a lot. What I mean, and I was in the newspaper headlines. Yeah, yeah. You see what I mean? And then and he had me speaking in the schools and colleges and whatever. And one night, we had all the generals, all the uh, officers there, and me and Stokely and, uh, was there. And that uh, I was, we were speaking, and I got up and started speaking and talking about Africa and talking about revolution and talking about victory. And one that so jumped up and said, Mukasa, what's, what, what's your name, young man? I said, Willie Rex, Willie Rex. He said, there ain't no African name. <laughs> My name is Mukasa. And all of them started saying, Mukasa, Mukasa. So what does Mukasa it's, mean? It means God of the water. Damn. Yeah. And they said, Mukasa. And I've been Mukasa ever since. Oh, damn. And then he I mean heard about it, told him about it, and he uh, uh, laughed and told me, your name is Mukasa, and said, uh, Mukasa, we want y'all to always come home to Africa, mm -hmm. get your politics, and then go abroad. Mm -hmm. So yes, we want to we want to thank we want to uh, stop there and thank you no so much for coming, man. This has no been in, in any you know if, in any fair world or world in which Africans really knew who we were as a people, you know you would never have to go anywhere without being shown love and mm. privilege and insight. You are a true hero of our experience. No uh, and we are so honored to have you here, brother. So yes, sir, thank brother. you for coming. We love yeah. you, man. And love have, you, and thank you all for inviting with. me here. And I'm honored to be here with everybody. And Africa must unite. Amen. Uh, I, I think before you go, I think all of us need to, uh, you need to lead the chant of black power so we can do this. Black business. power! Black, black power! power.
Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Yeah. 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 Hold tight. What's happening, man? Renegade coaches in the building. You know what I'm Live and direct. After another great show. Of course, great from show, Casa man. Donna in the man. building. Black Ooh, power legend, is full man. effect. No doubt, no doubt. Only, only a Renegade coach can you get some of the heaviest heavyweights. Mm -hmm. Some of you, some that you know, and some that you don't know, but you know they work by default. Yeah. You know what I mean? So definitely glad to see Mukasa again. Um, while we was rocking with Mukasa, our next guest came through. <laughs> Kicking stuff, hands, throwing stuff. You know what I'm saying? You know, what the mobile clock? So there's a part of the interview, you hear like a phone going off, yeah. or like that. You know what I'm saying? Sure going, hey, hey, hey. You know what I mean? And then, then they're going to look over at me like, fuck your chair. <laughs> like, y'all need to get this fixed. He's like, call the man. But anyway, without further ado, yes. we got recording artists. I mean, uh, uh, Minister Service is going to give you a bio real quick. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who we got here? Hey, yo, we got my man Red Fidel. He's a hip hop artist. Out of uh, Miami, Florida, mm -hmm. rocking out of the ATL. Yo, he's been around for a while, doing a few things. Uh, back in '96, he been doing this thing up, up until the day in 2001. He was featured on CeeLo's uh, first album. Uh, he's a speaker. He's an entrepreneur. He's pioneering what we call adult contemporary hip hop music. So, without any further ado, let me give it up for my man Red Fidel. Red, 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 Yes, yes, definitely, man. So, Red Fidel. Mm -hmm. Him. Okay, yeah. uh, five 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 is the latest album. No doubt. Yes, Tell us what, it, what that's about. We know that Jay Z had the four four four, and it was a dope contemporary. So you know you came with five five five. Next level. Where Beyonce at? <laughs> <laughs> I got Beyonce. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but uh, on the real now, it's funny you mentioned Jay Z because that actually was that actually was my inspiration. I kind of was like, okay, he did four four four. I want to take it a step up. So, uh, in actuality, numerically, the step up would be the next number five. But once I did 555 and started doing the numerology on it, it just all fell in place with ascension, manifestation, everything. Uh, five me being in a number of change and from a spiritual universal's place. So it was like very appropriate for me to actually name the album that because I felt like what I was doing was that next level. And then especially with me spearhead and then with this movement of adult contemporary hip hop. Because this album was like that, but he, it didn't have the genre heading on it. I'm actually giving it a name, giving it a movement and giving it a wave. So. So what is, what is adult contemporary hip-hop then? Adult contemporary hip-hop is basically hip-hop music that meets the adult listener where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of music, especially from the hip-hop and rap space, uh, still appeals to the youth and uh, the youth genre from a mainstream standpoint. Of course, you know, there are artists out there that aren't so known that, you know, still continue to do music. But I feel like there's a place for adult contemporary hip-hop, even on a mainstream level. Mm -hmm. Something to actually add a balance, because I don't have no problem with what's now being out there, but at the same time, everything is a balance. You know, you know, dis-ease is a result of an imbalance. So the dis-ease that you hear from an audible standpoint and from a musical standpoint is the void of this right here, adult, because it's inevitable. If you did music when you was younger, these rap artists, they're going to become older. So right. are you going to keep doing young music? Or it's inevitable, you got to see me. You mm -hmm. gotta, you're going to become an adult, and hence the term adult contemporary. You're going to have to transition your music into something that meets you where you're at, because life is growth, and growth is life. You know, I can appreciate that, you know what I mean, because of the fact that, yeah, we grew up in hip-hop. and We watched hip-hop. Indeed. We watched hip-hop grow up, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it, it, it's sad to see a lot of cats our age and older mimicking the teens. For you sure. You know what I'm saying? For sure. I can't, I can't walk around with, with slim... Uh, Part of my English nut huggers, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's just, it's just, just not my, it's just not my thing. You know what I'm saying? Yes, or, with a little yes, t-shirts and all that. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? Because we grown. Yes, sir. I can't have my pants hanging off my ass. I ain't knocking nobody else to do it. Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. But I'm 50. Yes, sir. And I don't think, you know what I'm saying? My, my woman wants to see me with my drawers hanging out. <laughs> That's right. You know what That's I'm right. saying? That's so right. I'm glad that you coming along with that because of the fact that that shows growth as well. Um, so the whole, you know. How long you been in this thing? I know that my man talked about uh, you had a track with CeeLo. I know you have a track with, with Stick on a new joint or whatever. Um, and, and I'm sure you've been in this for a while, but how long you been into hip hop itself as far as an artist? Uh, man, I'm, you say you're 50, I'm 48, I'll be 49 in June next month. Okay. So uh, I've been doing, I, I did my first record. I've always been, I was born into hip hop, but I actually got into 
art form seriously when I was like 15. I made my first record in Miami when I was like 15. Okay. And I never looked back from that point. So I've always had a thirst and an affinity for hip hop. It was just something that I just was, uh, I'm spiritually, I'm a griot. So, you know, it just all fell into place with hip hop. So I've been doing this since 15 to 48, 49. So you do the math. It's been quite some time. Yeah. Right. And uh, so I grew up in, in all the facets of it from that point as far as, you know, the era where we consider the golden era for being the 90s and all that. So I saw its transition. I saw its growth. I saw its progression and its regression, you know, such as, you know, life. But uh, it's been a long time, man. It's been a long time. And I have had my moments where, you know, when you get older and you start getting into your early 30s and like you said, you start seeing you start really wondering where your place is as a rapper. And, and it's because, you know, you got a rapper, you got an MC, you got an artist. You know what I'm saying? The artist kind of embodies both of the aforementioned. But then, you know, you start figuring out, trying to figure out where you fit into this because you're growing. You don't, and especially if you take on the family, you know, like you mentioned, I can't have the nut huggers on at 30 and 35. You know? <laughs> cool. Especially, I'm raising a son, I'm raising a daughter. Yeah. So it's like, where do I fit into this music? Mm. So it just, I just, but the love never goes away. It's a lot of artists. I started this journey with a lot of my friends and brothers who dropped music because they outgrew it. Mm -hmm. I never could outgrow it because if it's there and it's in you, that's what it is. Even when if I put the mic down, that beat I might hear might inspire me. My pen might go to dancing on the paper. I can't mm -hmm. stop it. So how do I find a way to continue this art form without feeling like I'm really still stuck in the time warp? Because mm -hmm. you find a lot of artists, they, they kind of get subjected to that. So really quick, we're going, we're going to go to a bold question real quick. Yeah. But I want, to get, uh, I want you to quickly tell us the origin of your name, uh, Red Fidel. How you get yes. that? Uh, man, it's funny, man, for a long time, cause, and brother and, and, and Minister Server know me as this name. For a long time, I actually went by the name Jahala. A lot of people know me by Jahala. Jahala. Yeah, people know me by Jahala. And, then, um, and it's interesting because as I evolved, you know, a lot of times you take on different tones. Names are tones. And, you know, vibratorily, as a, man, as a man, I started to change, and I just felt like spirit was just telling me to, you know, find something that was pretty much like more innocuous. Mm -hmm. Because when you hear the name Jahala, some names carry like a certain connotation with it. You, when you heard Jahala, you know I was going to come with some conscience or something, mm -hmm. you know, in that, rhyme, that line. Well, you know, I'm a man. I fall short. And sometimes I might want to talk about some bullshit. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I'm on such and such. So I was trying to see where can I find or put myself into a space whereas you didn't know where I was going to come from. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So, and then growing up in Miami, my skin complexion, they always called us red. What's up, red? Yeah, so yeah. I, that was innocuous. Yeah. And then I'm of Cuban descent. So Fidel came about because of my, I did my ideology, my ideals, mm -hmm. the person mm -hmm. I represent. It's like my socio, you know, saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. boy, I'm very radical. I'm such and such. I am Jahala. Jahala is the, the Fidel side of it all. Mm -hmm. But Red kind of like is the out front man, you know, like I'm, yeah. you don't know where I'm going to be. like from. Detroit, Red. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Miami. Exactly. Well, exactly. Well, you know what I'm saying? Red, Red, we call him Beige Kamau. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why you got to throw that up in there? I'm saying, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go, go, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to let that go. Exactly. Don't say a word. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Say beige, yeah, come on. on. We're going to move on. Yeah, wow, man. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Motherfucker. Yeah. Sure. So sure. they got me so I said I opened it up the question. Like, <laughs> okay, we got a bold question for you. Oh, shit. Sure. That's a yeah, right. right. started reading the question. I, I was like, let me just get this goddamn thing out the way. What is so my name? We got, we got, what we do here is uh, called Knock is Nonsense. We got a little bold question, which I may yes. break after this is over. Okay. Um, <laughs> so there's like a whole bunch of questions up in here. We only want you to pick one question, one question, no worry. We want you to read it out loud and then give us an answer. And, and read that shit faster than how you talk. You'd be like, and then so on and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> That's the red part. Who will win versus between Tribe Called Quest versus Outcast? Mm, okay. This man said, okay. Quickly, okay. quickly, okay. quickly okay. said Outcast. You gotta, you gotta give a little explanation <clears throat> of why on that one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is it really an explanation needed? Ooh! Wow! Hey, hold on. You can't, you can't just throw tribe with the bus. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, but you, you know what? Make, you, you don't like the lyrics as much as you like the production. The production of Midnight. It, tribe Called Quest from Midnight. That would have said who was better producers, then I had to take time. But from a lyrical standpoint, that's not even a question. I don't know. Fife yeah. was pretty dope. Yeah, Fife was dope. Fife was dope, dope, but Fife was yeah. dope. I Fife think Fife was, was better. Fife was doper than, 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 than the big, big Boy. Uh, yeah, the Big Boy. Yeah. Not lyrically. No, nah, not lyrically. Not lyrically. You think so? No, not lyrically. No, Fife, no, I Fife, remember Fife. Fife, Fife was good, but Fife was kind of like, you know. Witty. Kind of he was witty, but if you, you know, as an artist, I look at it from different angles. He was kind of like, uh, and I hate to say this, but oh. it was kind of like, it was simple. It, had oh. a sim it was kind of simple to it. Uh, it, it, it was, it was, it was, it was 
Quentin was, did it. it, it well, we're gonna see what simple. Brent Fidel can do and not keep it simple. <laughs> no, I mean like, <laughs> and that's no, that, but that's 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 that's